Good morning and welcome to the 12, 21st annual exhibit of hydrogen fuel cell technology. We've been here for quite some time talking about the commercialization and the progress within this field. The progress has been enormous. We still have issues to face. Of course, one of them is the infrastructure for hydrogen fuel cells. We need to have stations where people can fill up their tanks and uh, continue to drive. And uh, we have one of the specialists in the gas field to talk about this issue. Specifically, it's Alexander Zerner, who's from the Lindy, Linda Group, and we'll be talking specifically about hydrogen refueling and hydrogen infrastructure. Please welcome with me Alexander Zerner. Hello. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> Good morning. Um, of course, the booth is just around the corner here, yeah. but uh, for those who haven't seen yet or don't know, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about Linda, which is such an interesting country, a company with an interesting history. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, Linda is a globally active uh, industry gases uh, company and uh, with a tr um, history of more than 135 years. And um, we are one of the leading specialists for the production, storage and applications of hydrogen. And uh, our cutting edge in this area is based on the uh, development of uh, efficient technologies, for example, um, efficient uh, compressions for liquid and uh, gaseous hydrogen, and also safe fueling. So, a big issue. Mm -hmm. Now, when we get to the issue of gas specialists, of course, uh, moving towards hydrogen is. Uh, it's part of the game. You've been dealing specifically with hydrogen for a long time. Is it largely an industrial demand? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, currently, uh, hydrogen is not only a gas which is used uh, for, for mobile um, applications, for example, for, for uh, hydrogen cars. It's also a gas which is used in, in different industries example uh, for, for burning processes, for optimizing burning processes, uh, for the production of, of glasses and so on. So uh, hydrogen is a in, is in gas which is, uh, has a, a big usage uh, or different usage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we get to the issue of mobility using hydrogen, it's, such a, it's everyone's dream here. 2004 we saw some of the hydrogen cars, everyone fell in love with them. But it's always the problem of in infrastructure. When I drive um, back to Berlin, for instance, on the side of the highway, I've never run into a hydrogen station. So I suppose the first question is, are there any fueling stations around? Where do the vehicles that exist get refueled? Yes, um, currently we are in a situation that we want to build up the hydrogen infrastructure. And um, of course, it's the fact that uh, the, first auto, uh, the first car manufacturer, uh, especially um, Hyundai and Toyota, mm -hmm. uh, go into the market entry until this year. And uh, that makes it necessary to build up a hydrogen infra infrastructure to make it possible that uh, the future customers can use this car uh, in the same way like the usage of a normal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. um, but I must say, currently we are in a situation that we have uh, just around uh, 15 stations, in, for example, in Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of these stations are installed in, in, in city areas like Berlin, uh, Munich, Stuttgart, Hamburg. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next step, or the next important step, is to make sure that the customers are in this situation that they can use the car to go, for example, from Hamburg to Munich. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, at some point, we all dream of having that highway with a station um, and uh, uh, in addition to diesel and conventional uh, gas, there would also be um, hydrogen. But what is operating right now is also uh, important, I would as as assume. There are um, fleets of buses, there are fleets of very effective forklift trucks. Um, uh, that are operating and they use um, hydrogen, sometimes batteries and hydrogen together. Um, is it easier to work with fleets of buses when you think of just the issue of refueling them? Uh, you know, fleets of buses in various cities, you've worked with these customers who come to you to solve the issues yeah. of how to fuel um, a fleet of buses. Is it easier to deal with them? Uh, especially buses and uh, materially handling vehicles are uh, a big issue today, of course, um, the demand for these applications is getting more and more, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's not really easy to handle with it. Of course, um, especially for the refueling of parts, you have completely 
uh, new technologies. That means you have a big amount of hydrogen which you need. You need um, powerful compressors. And, um, but one point which make it easy is it uh, cause of the fact that most of the buses uh, will be refueled directly at the bus depots. That means they, they, uh, they, that are only uh, fueling stations directly at the depots. For the um, materially handling vehicles, it's, it's like the same, but um, all in one, um, the demand of, of um, fleet or the, of the market entry of this entire fleet has started, especially in the US. But uh, now we uh, can recognize that, in, especially in Germany, we are also in a situation that the fleets uh, or that the demand will be going up. So we need more and more uh, distribution companies or production companies will be, um, will be seeing business case to use these hydrogen-driven uh, material handling vehicles um, because of the fact that you don't uh, need any loading time, you don't need um, battery replacement, and uh, as well, um, a, another big advantage is uh, most of the big production plants, for example, have their own facilities for, for battery replacement and battery charging, and that's a point which you don't need, because mm -hmm. um, if you are in a situation to go or to work with a hydrogen-fueled material handling vehicle, the refueling needs less than three minutes, mm -hmm. and uh, then you can use it uh, like before. Mm -hmm. We've seen some of these vehicles on the fair here, and in fact, you yeah. can see some this year as well. They're rather interesting because um, it's a, a classic example of where fuel, fuel cell technology is already uh, viable. And when I say viable, I mean financially viable purely on a business model, it's worth it. You buy one of these machines, you no longer have to have three sets of batteries. Occasionally that was one issue. Storage areas for the batteries, and you have an eight-hour charging time for the batteries. So how quickly did you mention this, I believe? How quickly can you refuel um, a hydrogen-driven forklift truck? It, it depends directly at the um, specifications of the truck. That means the capacity of the hydrogen uh, pressure vessels is, a, is the biggest point of that, and uh, how fast is it possible to refuel it. Um, in, in Brexit, uh, we, we think about, so that means you can refuel between 19 seconds and uh, 3 minutes. Okay, but it's still 3 minutes, that yeah. is, um, you spend more time at a gas station in line waiting for the guy to, in yeah. front of you to move. So. Uh, it sounds like a good deal. Um, uh, the bus fleets, uh, do they have any specific issues as well? I'm, I'm sure that uh, just due to the design of buses, the tanks look different, for example. Um, perhaps the quantity of hydrogen in a bus tank is larger. What are the specific aspects of the tanks and buses that are interesting? The, the challenge is uh, to make it possible to refuel the bus as fast as possible. Because mm -hmm. uh, in our um, uh, life, Time is money, and uh, so uh, our challenge is uh, to develop um, efficient uh, compressors which make it possible to refuel a bus in less than 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about amount of, of up to 30 kilograms of hydrogen, which you need up to compress up to 350 bar in these buses in less than 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a big point, but it is possible, of course, and uh, now we are still working to, to get an, uh, more efficient uh, compressions for the future, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, here at the uh, hydrogen fuel cell um, stand, you realize that there are small players and then monstrous players. When I say monstrous, the energy providers, uh, gas companies, small players, often these very small companies design the fuel cells um, and they require help. Uh, from outside their own um, group of engineers. That is, they go to larger companies to get their bipolar plates. They rely on people with manufacturing technologies. The infrastructure issue is one issue as well, where we need really the help of Linda, um, uh, because without larger players, um, uh, it's just very expensive to set up a station. One has to assume that there's going to be a hydrogen fuel station somewhere, and at the beginning, maybe it'll serve 10, maybe 30 cars a day, and that's impossible for an owner of a gas station to afford. So 
when we move into, and this is really a jump in question, when we move into a national infrastructure for automotive consumer, automotive applications, we're talking about those sports cars outside that look so sexy, yeah. um, we have an entirely different issue. It has to be a national grid. Um, you work with joint initiatives, don't you? Not simply Linda, but with other partners to develop this in infrastructure. I, I think the build up of hydrogen infrastructure is, is such a big issue. Um, it's not possible to to be alone and to to uh, to get an inf build up of infrastructure. That means you need strong partners, and you need strong uh, uh, initiations. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are still uh, working together in, in different in initiations. For example, the California Fusel Partnership. Also, uh, the CEP, the Clean Energy Partnership, one of the uh, biggest. Um, uh, initiatives in Germany, uh, there are only over 16 partners of different um, segments like, like um, car manufacturers, um, power, electric power supplier and uh, as well um, industries, gases industries and so on. And we are also all working together at one target to build up a hydrogen infrastructure. And in 2012, we have, we have um, built up the joint venture called uh, H2 Mobility. And um, H2 Mobility has a target to build up uh, an infrastructure of 400 hydrogen stations until 2023. Mm -hmm. And that's the next big step we will be going for the future. I should mention that if there are any questions from the audience, all you have to do is raise your hand and we'll uh, run over with a microphone. Um, there's always been this um, interesting moment in the industry. When we started years ago, uh, people would test vehicles and uh, with pride the engineers would show up with the car and the car would run perfectly. You step on the gas and something really happens. They're really, really nice vehicles and they have been nice for quite some time. Uh, but of course we got a lot of criticism because in order to test that vehicle, you'd occasionally have a diesel truck driving through Nevada to some isolated location to fill up one car uh, with hydrogen and then to drive the diesel truck back. That is, we literally had journalists writing essays about us, clean technology, come on, you know, where did you get the hydrogen from? So the real uh, interesting issue is that hydrogen is a wonderful way to store renewable energy that is produced when there's too much sun or too much wind. Uh, so do you also address this question? This is a vital question. We talk about hydrogen, but we also talk about green hydrogen, and you mentioned this specifically as we were preparing. Green hydrogen is hydrogen, of course hydrogen doesn't exist uh, naturally, um, in a pure state, you have to create it, you use energy for that. So the big question is where you get that energy from. So how important for you in developing this infrastructure is an infrastructure based on green hydrogen? It's very important. Because um, as we can see, uh, especially for battery, battery electric or hydrogen driven um, vehicles, uh, the, the focus is still on the CO2 emissions of this car. Mm -hmm. And uh, for battery and fuel cell uh, cars, uh, everybody looks not only can I go with a car with no zero emissions, I can say for battery and the fuel cell electric, yes. Mm -hmm. But it is also for the production of the hydrogen, and mm -hmm. there is, there's a difference. For us, it is also possible to produce hydrogen in a large scale, mm -hmm. of course. But um, for future mobile mobility, it is necessary to use, as you mentioned, green hydrogen. That means currently we are still in, in process. We, are, we have installed different uh, production facility where we can produce green hydrogen, consists of um, biofuels or biomaterials, consists of um, different uh, manufacturing, manufacturing methods, which allowed us to say, yes, we are able to support our customers with green hydrogen. And that's a big step for the future and very important. Mm -hmm. I see we have a question here in the audience. Yes, hi. I'm interested in uh, four numbers. Yeah. What's today's price for hydrogen fuel for a car in Europe? What's today's price for hydrogen fuel for a car in California? And what are the two target prices? for hydrogen fuel for a car in Europe and hydrogen fuel for a car in California? 
Um, currently in Germany, I, I can only talk about Germany, but um, in Germany you can buy uh, one kilogram of hydrogen directly at the uh, fueling station for one euro fifty. Uh, sorry, nine euro fifty. Yeah. So that means um, the the hydrogen vehicles have a driving range of 600 kilometers and uh, they need one kilogram of hydrogen for 100 kilometers. That means currently you are in a situation to go uh, with a price of one, uh, 9 euro 50 for 100 kilo. Uh, 100 kilometer. You're also part of the California stuff, so where's California going with the pricing? I, I don't know, really. And what's the target in Europe? How are you going to bring that pricing down so it's gasoline equivalent? It's, it's, a, it's a target for the future that we are still in, in a process with the governance um, to make sure that the price for hydrogen will be less to over the future and uh, to make it um, um, competitive with, with normal gasoline. That's a big point. Hmm. Of course, if, if we are in a situation that hydrogen is much more expensive like, like gasoline or diesel, we must be true. Nobody wants to buy an uh, electric or uh, especially a hydrogen fueled car. I just wanted to add, I think uh, the price of 9 euro 50 is without taxation, is it? It is without taxation. So yeah. are there any ideas about how to tax hydrogen in the future? That's, that is one of the um, issues which we are talking about uh, with, with the governance of, of Germany, especially or the European Union, to, to clarify these issues. Yeah. We, we, we can see how important and how vital this subject is, and we can go on and on. The details here, by the way, are phenomenally important. And also the debate about this, when we talk about the price of hydrogen, you can also ask at the same time, um, uh, are we counting on the price of hydrocarbons um, to remain stable? Where are they going to go? To have a debate where prices seem to have collapsed, for whatever reason, uh, is interesting to look at the uh, sustainability of, let's say, the German economy right now with the natural gas coming from a relatively unreliable region means that you have to reframe the debate. So for me, it's, it's the shifting sands underneath. What is certain is that there are interesting things. Uh, th just on the last question here, and this is a tangent from what we've been discussing, but when we talk about the infrastructure, everyone dreams of small solutions as well. If you've got a fueling station that's only going to service 30 cars, how far away are we from a tiny fueling station that has a solar cell, an electrolyzer, and a pressurizer that operates almost in independently of any other grid. Is that possible? Do you dream of these things as an engineer when you go to sleep at night? I, I think possible of everything. So, and um, as we can see currently, we go different ways to build up a hydrogen infrastructure. Uh, you will find a hydrogen station where we produce a hydrogen on site with electrolyzers, with, with uh, solar energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, then on the other side, we also find hydrogen stations where we uh, deliver the hydrogen on site. So that means it, it completely depends um, on the space on the hydrogen uh, on the directly at the station. Mm -hmm. So that means mm -hmm. for us it is important to develop uh, hydrogen station with a small footprint mm -hmm. to make sure that we can install this hydrogen station at every possible refueling station uh, worldwide. Mm -hmm. So th th why this is so interesting is because, of course, uh, if you reframe the debate in a, in, a, in a small region in India that doesn't have um, a, a, a grid network of natural gas or competitive hydrocarbons, they don't even think about the issue of the comparative price there. They want to get a small community operating. They want their cell phones running. Yeah. They don't want air conditioning. And, you know, so it's an entirely different wonder technology, whereas here we have this comparison of historically generated facts. Um, Alexander, it's been a pleasure talking to you from the Linda Group. Um, it's uh, wonderful to have you here. Hope to see you back next year. We have to continue the conversation. Right around the corner at B77 is where their booth is located. Uh, we look forward to continuing the debate with you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. Please remain seated. The drinks are on the house. We'll be up in uh, one minute with another conversation. We'll be talking to Andre Chuvilov who's from uh, HiSafe, uh, and Dr. Thomas Jordan. And they'll be talking about public acceptance of hydrogen technologies and applications, a very important subject. Be prepared.
Thank you.